Welcome back to the final part of Lecture 1. In the final part of this lecture, we're going to have a brief look at what the discipline of chemical engineering does in terms of turning raw materials into finished products. We'll see that in order to do this, chemical engineers have to understand and process information from a very wide range of different length scales, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. We will see that chemical engineering is a very multidisciplinary profession. It spans a very wide range of industries and will give you a very wide range of career options to choose from in the future. So, here on the whiteboard I've put three examples of typical raw materials that the chemical and process industries might use. There's a bottle of crude oil, Illinois crude, there's some elemental sulphur and there's some sugar cane. Now, these are not the only raw materials that the chemical and process industries use, but they're good representative examples of organic, inorganic, and biologically based raw materials. Now, from a very small number of raw materials, a very wide range of products are made on an amazingly large scale. This is the thing that separates the chemical engineering from chemistry. We are making products out of our industry for tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. If you think about the images of the useful products that I've put on there, one is a polyester shirt. Polyester is a polymer that is sourced ultimately from crude oil. If you think how many polyester shirts there are in use today, then the number is going to be hundreds of millions. I've put some sugar cubes on there, which are of course in part made from sugar cane. And if you think of the number of sugar cubes used in the world today, again, there will be tens if not hundreds of millions of sugar cubes used. I've also put an example of some pharmaceutical products, again a product of the chemical and processing industries, and if you look at the global pharmaceutical industry in terms of revenue, it is vast. So here is in effect a picture that frames the problem of chemical engineering. We take small number of raw materials, order of 10 or 20 or 30, and turn them into a very wide range of consumer-facing useful products on a very, very large scale indeed. In order to do that, we transform these raw materials into these finished products. And let's think for a moment about these transformative processes. First of all, these processes have to be safe. There is no excuse for not doing anything safely and with due regard for people in this industry. They have to be environmentally responsible. We live in an age now where the past activities of mankind are beginning to take a serious toll on the planet that we live on. And so anything that we do now and anything that we do in the future has to be environmentally responsible. They have to be socially responsible. If you live next to or near any large processing installation, an oil refinery, a coffee factory, a, um, a chemical works, then you'll see that they are very significant bits of infrastructure that have a very large impact potentially on the community around them. The key here is social engagement. If you look back in history as to how this was done in the old days of the British chemical industry, you will see that there were lots of community-based projects run by the large companies in order to benefit the societies that lived adjacent to their works. Finally, these processes have to be cost effective. I've put that third and last for a very good reason, because if things aren't safe, and if things aren't environmentally and socially responsible, whether they're cost effective or not is immaterial because they won't happen. The sorts of transformations taking place in these processes are very wide ranging as well. They can be physical transformations, for example, crystallising sugar from a sugar solution. They can be chemical transformations, for example, turning that raw sulphur that I have there into sulphuric acid. They could be biological transformations. The picture of the sugar cane there is a good example. That would be biologically transformed into ethanol. This is a very popular transformation, typically. So these transformations take place on typically molecular length scales. So let's think now about the le different length scales that are associated with chemical engineering. 
Let's start off by thinking about molecules. Here on the whiteboard, I've put a picture of a zeolite catalyst. It's a very complex structure. This is zeolite ZSM25. And this catalyst is widely used in the petrochemical industries to break up long hydrocarbon molecules into short hydrocarbon molecules, a process commonly known as cracking. These cracking catalysts add value to long chain molecules because typically long chain molecules aren't that useful whereas the shorter chain molecules are very useful either as petrochemical raw materials or as fuels. So chemical engineers have to work with chemists to understand how things on the molecular scale work. However, chemical engineers don't just think about the molecular scale. So here on the board, I've put a picture of a chemical reactor. We've got a catalyst. That catalyst isn't just going to sit in a heap on the floor and do things. That catalyst has to be contained within a vessel. And that vessel has to be designed such that it is safe and such that it is operable. So, for example, how do we support that catalyst in that vessel? How do we make sure that the products that we're feeding into that vessel contact the catalyst correctly and that the resultant end product comes out of that reactor correctly? What temperature and pressure do we have to operate this catalyst at in order for it to work effectively? So therefore, how do we design this vessel in order to accommodate that temperature and pressure? What material is the vessel made from? What's the wall thickness? How do we get heat into or out of the vessel? How do we control that temperature or control that pressure? How do we keep this process safe? Moreover, how do we install this vessel? How do we put the catalyst inside it? How do we maintain this vessel and ultimately at process end of life, how do we decommission this vessel? So now all of a sudden chemical engineers don't look like chemists anymore. There's a lot of mechanical engineering involved, there's a lot of fluid dynamics involved, there's a lot of thermodynamics involved, heat transfer, mass transfer. So this happens at a larger scale. These chemical reactors can be anything from bench scale for pilot plant through to maybe three or four meters in diameter and 20 meters high for large petrochemicals use. However, chemical engineers don't just design equipment. They design plants. Here on the board is a picture of a plant complex in Scotland. These plants consist of thousands of items of equipment, all interlinked together by pipework, by communications cables, sometimes by conveyor systems. And so the entity that converts a raw material into a finished product, whether it be petrochemical, whether it be food, whether it be drink, or whether it be pharmaceutical, will in some way bear a resemblance to this photograph. Remember, the scale is that we're producing products for tens of millions of potential customers. However, chemical engineers don't just design equipment and plants and molecules, they design products. So here on the board is a particularly popular product from part of the process industries. It's chocolate. Chocolate is fabricated in chocolate manufacturing facilities and the principles of heat transfer and mass transfer and mixing and fluid dynamics apply just as much to chocolate processing as they do to oil refining. However, what we want to do in this particular case is design this confectionery product with the correct characteristics. It all comes down to crystal structure, the crystal structure of the cocoa butter fat phase. The chocolate we all love to eat, that melt-in-the-mouth treat, has crystal form 5 in cocoa butter. However, when chocolate blooms, crystal form 5 changes to crystal form 6. It's chemically identical, but it's physically different. So chemical engineers have to understand how to manipulate and tailor that crystal structure, that physical structure, to the desired product characteristic. Finally, in terms of length scales, chemical engineers have to worry about one of the biggest length scales that there is, the planet. How do we design processes that are key to delivering good environmental performance? How do we achieve net zero as a planet? It's going to be in part through very good chemical engineering. How do we remove the pollution that we have spread around the planet? It is going to be through good recycling, which needs good chemical engineering analysis in order to be effective. So, in summary, chemical engineers worry about everything from molecular scale to global scale. As you might imagine, chemical engineers therefore will work in a variety of different industries. 
a lot of this section of the course, I'm going to be talking about the traditional chemicals industry. But I don't want you to get the impression that the traditional chemicals industry is just where chemical engineers work. Far from it. Chemical production industries, of course, make up a part of modern chemical engineering. However, also if we think about what's produced on a large scale, food and drink is a massive, massive deal. So you'll find as many chemical engineers in food production and drink production as you will in refining, for example. Chemical engineers also will work as safety professionals. The big sites that you see, that picture that I put on the board a few slides ago, are by their very nature hazardous areas. There's things at high pressure and high temperature and chemically nasty materials. And so operating these sites safely without any accidents is a very important part of our discipline. And so part of the people working in our discipline will take safety as their key role. The water industry sometimes gets overlooked from a chemical engineering standpoint, but it is vital. Clean water worldwide is one of the single biggest challenges as a species that we also face. And providing clean water into those places that so desperately need it is a very large chemical engineering challenge. Chemical engineers work in biotechnology. Biology has had millions of years to work out how to make certain transformations from raw material to finished product in a very energy effective manner. And so the chemical engineering of the future is going to be using a lot more biotechnology to have low energy transformation routes. A traditional topic, oil and gas, is still with us today and will be for some decades yet. Because as we will see when we talk about the structure of industry, as well as providing energy, oil and gas provide the process industries with vital raw materials. So we can achieve net zero and still be using oil or gas as a raw material to make stuff out of, not to burn. Materials processing is a very important part of chemical engineering as well. We've talked about chocolate, that's a very good material processing example, but material processing extends itself to anything where the physical form of material is very important. For example, titanium dioxide can be used both as photocatalyst in one physical form or white paint pigment in a different physical form. So understanding how to process materials into their correct physical form will ultimately tailor their characteristics into different products. Chemical engineers may work solely in design, design of equipment, design of plant, to support all these industries. You'll find chemical engineers running businesses, managing businesses. These big plants, these big sites, are multi-billion dollar or multi-billion pound affairs. And so chemical engineers not in only need to know the technical nature of their discipline, but they need to understand how business works and they need to be able to work effectively and safely with sometimes thousands of people. Consultancy is another popular area for chemical engineers to work in, be it within the processing industries or outside of the processing industries. The numeration skills that chemical engineers learn, the information assimilation skills that chemical engineers learn, make them very, very good problem solvers. Research and development is particularly pertinent to university environment. Um, I work as a chemical engineer. I will always say that I am a chemical engineer first and an academic second, because although I will work in R&D, I see myself as an engineer, adding engineering value to research projects. The picture I want to paint, and hopefully that I've succeeded in doing, is that chemical engineering is a very, very broad discipline and gives you the chemical engineers of the future, a very broad arena in order to choose how you want to take your future path. So let's sum up with a few key points. Chemical engineering originated with industrial chemicals production, but today it is a very multidisciplinary profession, and chemical engineers and chemical engineering are going to be key to delivering those essential environmental targets of the future, particularly net zero.